Welcome back to Felony Miami. I'm your host, Joe Stone. On today's program, we have three guests in the studio, and we're going to be talking about felony disenfranchisement, felon voting rights. So uh, to my right, I have Joe Clock, an attorney who has legislated cases through every court level in Florida, including two successful arguments in the Supreme Court of the United States that resulted in President Bush succeeding in his bid for the White House in 2000. And for 32 days following the presidential election in 2000, he headed a team of 20 lawyers who represented then Florida Secretary Catherine Harris in various Bush-Gore election challenges. And Joe is still active in corporate and criminal law. Welcome to the program. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Uh, directly across from me, we have A.J. Hill. A.J. is a Miami native and a member of SPAM All-Stars. A.J. has also been a pioneer in the Miami music scene for many, many years. He's recorded and toured with many, many successful artists, including Sly and the Family Stone, Ricky Martin, Maria Conchita Alonso, and uh, the uh, Haitian band Scandal. And he's also worked with Johnny Dredd, one of our <laughs> local successful guys. Uh, you uh, Also, A.J., you have... Uh, AJ and the Stick People. AJ and the Stick People, yes. You got them coming out. You got a new album coming out. You're going to be doing some live stuff with that. Working on it, yeah. All right. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you. You've been forewarned. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. And to my left, we have Mr. Grant Stern, Miami native, uh, mortgage broker at Morning Morningside Mortgage, and he's the host of the Only in Miami show. How do you say that? The only in Miami show. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and the uh, only in Miami networks. He's also a columnist for Occupy Democrats. And he's an activist and protester who battled Walmart single-handedly in court and won. Thanks for having me on the show, John. Thanks for being here. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a topic that has uh, been around for many, many, many years. Um, Disenfranchising felons is actually something that started back in Greek and Roman times. So it's not something new that Florida just concocted to, to be mean to its uh, electorate. Um, it's, it's something that's been around for a long time, I guess reserved for those infamous and heinous crimes where somebody would require to have a civil death. So there's just been a petition filed uh, over 700,000 people signed this petition to carry this to the, um, the ballot so that the people in the state of Florida could vote. Now, Florida is only one of four states in the union that still has these laws on its books. And I am super curious of all of your positions on this. Right, wrong, should we keep it in effect? Should we change it? I'm going to kick it off to the lawyer in the room, Joe Clock, and ask your position on disenfranchisement. I think as soon as people finish their debt to society, they should get their civil rights back. I don't think there's any basis whatsoever to disenfranchise them. And I'm not so sure it's going to have all that big an impact on the results in elections, which people think it will, because I think you may motivate other people to vote who, who wouldn't necessarily vote. But I think disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement from voting, the inability to secure housing, the inability to secure jobs, just basically makes it possible for the correctional system to survive as an industry in the state. And I think if we did something about all of those things, we go a long way to solving a lot of our sociological problems. I would agree with that. I guess one of the biggest questions for all of us is, how do we make those changes? And that's one of you know the charters of Felony Miami and, and these conversations we're having. How do we make these changes? How do we? Grant, you fought Walmart and you won. There's a song there, but <laughs> well, how, do we, how do we do it? Well, you know, disenfranchisement, after the debt has been paid by a felon to society, achieves the exact opposite effect of the whole entire point of rehabilitation. Okay? If somebody has committed a crime and you want to reintegrate them into civil society, how can you do that? by pushing them away from the most basic act of civil society, which is getting to decide who makes the rules. And furthermore, there's a bigger societal problem that we have in our criminal justice system related to felonies, which is that these laws were written 
decades, sometimes hundreds of years ago. And what was a felony back then may not be such a serious offense today. And I think the best example of that is grand theft. $250 worth of theft 50 years ago would have been a pretty serious crime. Sure. $250 worth of theft today might be an accidental crime like a shoplift or just, you know, some somebody yeah. possessed a piece of stolen property. and yeah, You picked up the wrong cell phone. Yeah, they bought yeah. the wrong cell phone sure. and now they're a felon. And, mm-hmm. and I'm sure that's happening. And, you know, there's just... There's crime and punishment, but what we have is something along the lines of crime and a system that needs money, and that perpetuates punishment. Yeah. AJ, hey, I'm going to echo what Grant said, and uh, I think uh, there's a whole systematic effort to cast out people and to uh, you know just to make the club, uh, the elite club. Uh, <sighs> less dirty, you know, in, in, in certain minds. It's punitive, and it should be reformative. The prison system should be reformative. You're, you know, uh, if you look at other countries, they reform the prisoners. So they cut down the recidivism rate. Uh, and I think uh, if you switch the topic from restoring voting rights to gun rights, you'll see a, a total paradigm shift you'll see it shift especially from the right the political right um the concern becomes about the right then the right, right to own a gun yeah. and there was um an effort by republicans in a, a few years back to uh they used the example of a, a guy that wrote a bad check that couldn't buy a gun anymore couldn't buy a rifle and they use all their efforts and all their energy to reintegrate him because, you know, they wanted him to have his gun. But if you switch the conversation to voting rights, then you're integrating someone into a society. You're giving them the rights that other people have, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I hear what Joe is saying on this topic that, I mean, clearly we all agree. I think everybody that thinks this through agrees, hey, you know what, you did your time. You, you paid for yes. it. You know what? You, you're back. You, you can come back. Um, but on a societal level, you know, um, it, it just doesn't seem to me that we are rehabilitating and allowing these people to come back in. And if we do want to have a healthy society, which I think we all do, the point being don't bring these people in so quickly to begin with. It seems to me that people are being hit with felony charges so quickly now, and that eliminates not just the voting aspect of it, because what Joe said is true. Maybe it won't affect the electorate that much, but it affects the community. Well, take a look at the... uh, One of the things that disturbs me a great deal is if you look at the federal laws with respect to, like, felon in possession of a weapon, Section 922, um... You can have, if somebody has a certain number of felony convictions, they can be put away for a minimum mandatory of 15 years. Now, Congress couldn't possibly have intended that the mill that goes on down in the Gerstein building, where people don't have the ability to properly represent people and fight cases all the way through, and they say, oh, take a plea, take a plea, take a plea, that that's what Congress had in mind that you go away for 15 years for. Moreover... The, the Gerstein it, building is a, is a courthouse yeah, here in Miami. That's the local yeah. courthouse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, <clears throat> and then also significantly, if you live in inner city areas, why can't you have a gun? I mean, if, if, if your crime is one that involved the abuse of a weapon, maybe... But what are you supposed to defend yourself with if you live in Liberty City or the Swamp or Overtown or something like that? What are you supposed to do? Call a policeman? Why would you do that? They don't trust them anyway. And, you know, they have cause not to. Or they don't for whatever reason. So a lot of the laws we have don't make any sense. But I think the two key laws, in addition to voting, which to me is a no-brainer, is employment and housing. Yeah, those sure. two things we have to do yeah. something about, and we can do something about those locally. We can pass local ordinances that make it illegal to discriminate against someone based on whether or not they have a felony conviction, unless you can link specifically the crime with a danger of employment. Like you know, so that can be done on a local level. Sure. Well, okay, yeah, I didn't know that. Did you let guys me, know that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me let me add on to that, which is to say that there's not a lot of distinction between felonies 
that are committed. There's nonviolent crimes. There's crimes that are going to be legalized pretty soon. There's drug felonies sure. that are going to disappear within the next five years or 10 years at the federal level, and people are still being locked up for these. So, you know, when you're talking about the employment part, here's a good example. Uh, you want to be a barber? Well, if you're a felon, you can't get the license. Mm -hmm. That's okay? a state license. Or maybe you have to, right. you know, beg the, the commissioning board and explain. And, and it's just, you know, if you're not a violent felon, why should anybody be worried about you being a barber? You know, sure. but by the same token, there are classes of crimes that should prevent people from entering certain fields. For example, the financial fields. When somebody has a felony that involves uh, lying, cheating, stealing, or financial crimes, they mm -hmm. should be barred from legitimate employment in the field. And right now, there's a major national scandal that's going on over that because of one of, Do of Donald Trump's business partners, a man named Felix Sater, sure. who committed first a violent crime which barred him from working in the securities business, but he found a loophole, committed an even larger crime, and then through the use of uh, being a cooperating witness, committed an even larger financial crime a few years later. And that's the kind of circumstance that people want to avoid, where you have right. someone who's got you know, the characteristics that should prevent them from being involved in a certain field. You know, right. a yeah. child uh, a molester should not be allowed to be an educate get a teacher's sure. license. But by the same token, someone that has a felony conviction that's nonviolent for, say, drug sales from their youth shouldn't be prevented from becoming a barber. Absolutely. Or, yeah. If you you're know, convicted of being uh, colluding with a foreign hostile government, you shouldn't have a certain job. You know that maybe uh, in national security, <laughs> yeah, national security, or or the head of a, the answer, well, a nation. Yeah. <laughs> There should be a connection between whatever the bar is sure. and the crime. Yes, right? yes. So be, because all these drug crimes, I mean, listen, these young, young men cannot get jo construction jobs. Who cares whether or not someone was convicted of possession of marijuana, right. sale of cocaine, right. if it has to do with whether or not you can carry cement bags or concrete bags to the seventh floor of a building. It's crazy. These people can't get jobs. These people can't live in public housing. These people can't live in private housing. So what are they supposed to do? All they do is feed the correctional system, which yeah. becomes a business. Yes. Correct. Yeah, and that becomes exactly. a burden on society. Now, there is a – there becomes, is, it, it is, it is a, a burden. burden. Well, it is a burden. It and there's a, a lot burden. of other burdens that we've talked about on this program before, such as the aging prison population. But, you know, the United States it imprisons more of its people than any Anyone country in, in the world. But uh, what you were saying, Grant, about there being kind of levels to these felonies, on the proposed ballot, um, there – saying they want to exclude rapists and murderers from ever getting those voting rights back. So clearly there is a, a, a bar. So it, where do we draw that line to say, okay, you, you have to have a civil death and you cannot participate in this society on decision-making, who gets to run the place because you did this, this, and this crime, and where do we draw the line that's below that? Nonviolent drug crimes, um, Aggravated assault. Where is Minor that line? Minor property crimes who, that have become okay. major felonies. Who now, makes that decision? Like that. Who? You know, well, we, I mean, the legislature needs to step up and set up a, a, an organized fashion. Not just our state legislature, but our, eventually our national one as well. Mm -hmm. And and categorize all this stuff and really break it down in a way that's you know modern, that is specific. Because doing otherwise, you know. It's gotten to the point where it's become a cruel and unusual punishment for people who have committed their crime, they've done their time, they've learned their lesson. Yes. And I don't know what the average sentence is for a nonviolent felony, but it can't be that long. I mean, otherwise there would be even more people in prison and – you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess one of the big problems in this country was when these mandatory minimums were put in place. And honestly, I think that's a conversation that, that needs to be had. And, and it's a bipartisan issue because now there are people on both sides of the aisle going, hey, wait a minute. Uh, maybe this is a little extreme. And we've had uh, episodes on Felony Miami. There was a woman who was uh, convicted and, and given a life sentence for a, a couple of ounces of crack cocaine. And she's serving a life sentence. That's a harsh. bit harsh. Um, well, where's the deterrent? <clears throat> where's the deterrent in these mandatory minimums? I mean – there, the, the application of them can be that absurd, but where's the deterrent factor? There is none. It's, 
it's unimaginable to the average person that it's like capital punishment, so punishment, so punishment doesn't side. work either. They they as if a deterrent. that's the purpose, but perhaps the purpose, depending on who you're dealing with, is the purpose of like restricting population and that kind of thing. If you look at the African American population in the United States today, the percentage today. It's not growing the way Latins and other ones are. Well, maybe the reason is because a lot of childbearing males are in prison and therefore unable to, to reproduce. So there could be, I mean, there's, uh, whether or not it's true or not, it may just be apocryphal, but the whole idea that maybe uh, the uh, uh, ab original abortion decision in the Supreme Court of the United States was motivated by a couple of justices that thought that it would be unfairly visited disproportionately on different ethnic groups, that certain ethnic groups would be more inclined to select an abortion than other ones, and it would control population. Well, when you're talking about that in particular, institutionalized racism, there's three books oh, yeah. that I'm not going to recap in full here, but uh, The Strange Career of Jim Crow, which is a book that uh, Martin Luther King used to read. There is The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Right. And... There is uh, slavery by another name, and and each of those three books should be seminal reading for anyone who cares about civil rights, and in particular slavery under uh, by by another name, um, which highlights the fact that after the Civil War, <clears throat> slavery was reinstitutionalized through the sheriff's offices. Yeah, anybody who is convicted of a crime is effectively becomes enslaved. It's not just a civil death. Another chain gain. It's it's civil slavery. Yeah, and. You know, the idea behind that was not rehabilitation, okay? The idea behind that was that these people could be contracted and they would become cheap labor. And but that still happens today. Yeah, it's, It does that, still that's happen happening today. today. It's Cronyism. not just change. It does still yeah, happen. Nothing has changed yeah, about sure. that. Yeah. And, and as you, you know, uh, slavery by another name really starts back during the Civil War. Then the long, strange career of Jim Crow picks up mm -hmm. uh, around 1900. When things changed in the South, when you had a group of very well-off individuals who didn't control the vote but needed to use racism as a means of getting people on the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder to vote in their favor. Yes. And the new Jim Crow examines how the civil rights era was rolled back by the courts. Well, I don't think – I really don't know that we're going to figure out exactly how all this voting – is going to come down. I mean, if you look at the emergence of of independence, okay, and you know we have a situation now what where the Democrats and Republicans probably only account for what sixty five percent of the registered voters, you know, and you don't know how those other people are going to vote. I mean, obviously, neither Barack Obama, Obama, nor Donald Trump were elected by the traditional parties. The, Barack Obama could not have made it in with the Democrats, and Trump couldn't have made it in with the Republicans. So you have independents and people that are registered different ways. And it used to be that it made a difference, perhaps, because people would sort of pick sides. But I think if you enfranchise people, you do not necessarily know where these things are going to land, okay? But as I said, you know, we have to, the, the voting thing is important, but I'll tell you what. <laughs> On a week-by-week -week basis, feeding your family is more important than voting. Yeah, I you know? hear what you're saying, but here's my, here's my biggest question. Why is there so much opposition to this then? Why, why is Florida – what is it? Florida, um, Iowa, uh, Kentucky – no. Um, Virginia – hold on. I'm going to get you the, the other states. That, that's Virginia, Iowa, Kentucky, and Florida. Because why are these states so opposed? Way. We've always done – anytime there's a change, people don't like change. You know, they, they assume that there's a reason for it. There's no reason for it. And so is it just lack of education? Is it ignorance? Is it ignorance on the part of the electorate? Are they, I mean, because if I walk up to anybody in the street and I say to them, hey, if somebody, you know, does a crime and they go to jail and they pay, the, they pay for their crime, they do their time, they, they do their, you think they should be able to get their rights back? I'm going to say nine out of ten people will say, well, yeah, of course. Well, maybe in Florida, for instance, let's use Florida as an example. Let's. There are structures in our state government which may have accidentally resulted in this, okay? We, for instance, for years and years and years, elected independent officers in government. We had an independently elected secretary of mm -hmm. state, attorney general, the, the, the financial officer, the ag commissioner. All the, they were all independently elected. And then they sat as a cabinet that voted. Now, in most states, that's not the case. You know, now in Florida, we're down to four elected officers. But for instance, our governor 
can't pardon independently. He requires a vote. There's four people. I think he requires a vote of three to be able to pardon someone. So the fact of the matter is, in Florida, it may have just gotten screwed up because of how our cabinet was set up. And but in other states, it's it's just no big deal. You know, when you when you've you know, finished your 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 punishment to society is it's reinstated. So this is an effect of the constitution of the state. Yeah, just well, custom, really, almost. Let me let me take that a step further, though, because there was a landmark ruling <clears throat> by a federal judge highlighting Governor Rick Scott's involvement in the felony uh, disenfranchisement. The recent happened. ruling. The recent ruling. Okay. And you know, former Governor Christ had tried to clear as much of the backlog as possible. And Governor Scott pretty much put the brakes on that. But Charlie Chris tried to try to set up a whole thing in 2007. Right, right. right. Mm-hmm. But he left office in 2011. And then Rick Scott are. shut yeah. the whole thing down. Pretty much. Yeah. So what's, what's important about that is, I mean, the, the judge called the system that Scott implemented nonsensical and called him out because he literally uh, – Asked, you know, people that talked about who they voted for got different results, disparate results in his hearings. Uh, a white man who said, I voted for you, got reenfranchised. A black woman who said, I, you know, I may not be one of your voters, did not. I mean, it was really that let me plain. That, that why that do was... you think Charlie Crist, why do you think Charlie Crist wanted to change the rules? Do you think he was just a very honorable person that, you know, became, was just overwhelmed by morality? Nonsense. He was running as a Democrat, switching parties. He thought that if he enfranchised these people, they'd vote Democratic. I don't think that's necessarily true. I'll answer that question in two parts. The first part is that puts the cart before the horse. He did all of the Mm -hmm. re-enfranchisement activities as a Republican and before he switched to an independent. He ran as independent after the term of his governorship. And when I spoke to Governor Christ uh, before he became a state rep, I asked him about it and I, I mentioned it. And he said that he felt personally it was very important because in his time as a prosecutor, as an attorney general for the state of Florida, he had seen the impact the heavy hand of the state's impact on felons who were being disenfranchised. We're talking about Chain Gang Charlie? That's right. The guy who <laughs> ran felt commercials it. all That's through right. North Florida about black people in chains? This mm. is the great hero? Come on, That's man. right. And, and I'm That's telling you right now, when I met uh, Charlie Crist in 2013, I thanked him for doing that. And he said he felt it was important because as somebody who was in the justice system, he had learned about this disenfranchisement problem. And that's why he took personal control of that. It was one of the biggest initiatives that Charlie Crist actually did sure. as governor of and Florida. And also he wanted to, uh, to gain some support from the, from the left, from the Democrats. Right. Sure. And the way yeah. that Rick Scott beat Charlie Crist was by running the chain gang Charlie commercials all through North Florida. That's because how he did North it. Florida carries. Yeah, exactly. but Rick, Rick Scott didn't run against Crist. Well, uh, who, who? Well, yeah, Rubio. he did. He did. He Rubio. did on the, the when Chris became the, I'm the, sorry. the Democratic. Yes, right. Rubio. Oh, yeah, the second time. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, the second time. But the point is, well, is that, okay. But, but look, let's forget about the politics of who. It's a social sure. issue. Okay, you know, uh, today everything has become. You can't even watch the news anymore because you know if you watch MSNBC or CNN, you know what the tilt's going to be. You watch Fox News, you know what the tilt's going to be. Right. If you want as objective a view as you can, you have to listen to BBC, which is ridiculous. To or get listen to Felony Miami, of course. Right. NPR? Yeah, you got to be kidding. No, because people on the right always think NPR is left-leaning. Um, maybe well, they are a little bit, but how about the Christian NPR? Science Monitor? Oh, that's, well, think, that's uh, people on the right think that anything outside the hardcore right is liberal. You know, and the and the, but, de- and the, the left wing doesn't think that. But here's no. the thing: I don't think that people on the right are necessarily mean people that want to say you can't vote because you're a felon. I mean, I know Republicans, sure. and they're not mean people. You know, they no, have a different not. they have a different concept of how things should be done than I do or you do, maybe. But they're not the mean fact is, people. If this issue is put in front of the electorate, they are going to enfranchise the convicted felons. That's what's going to happen. It's never been put in front of them. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, you know. To, but again, what I would like to get back, I and mean, I think, I mean, to me, that's kind of a no-brainer. But what really bothers me is housing and jobs. That's right. Because I agree. so much more, I mean. I agree. Yeah. I mean, from, I, I, you know, I accept what you say about the really importance of voting in terms of being able to shape policy. But on a day-by-day basis, I mean, the, 
you, you run into a young man, okay, a, a, you know, a young guy from, from, from the black community, right? Yeah. And uh, you ask him about his father, right? <laughs> and, and he'll say to you, um, uh, well, he doesn't know who his dad is, and he doesn't care who his dad is. Well, that's nonsense. And you don't know how that happened. Yeah. But, but for instance, right. if a woman is trying to raise a family, and she doesn't have any money, and she says to the guy, you want to see the kid? Put some cash on the table. That's understandable. That's understandable. But then what happens over a period of time is you have this complete breakdown in family structure. Whereas mm -hmm. if a man has the ability to go out and get a job and bring money home, then he can assert at least an equality with other people in the household who are able to bring in money as well. Because otherwise the woman's stuck having to support these kids. Well, let me point out something real quick. You know, you talk about knowing that the Florida electorate is going to make this happen. If they're allowed to. If they're allowed to make the decision. And, and to me what that suggests, and I think that everybody here can probably agree on that, Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever, mm -hmm. is that <clears throat> our system of government is not performing as intended because there's a lot of these issues where if you put it to the electorate, you'll get one result. But right now the, the, the situation is all in the hands of government. It has been for a long time. And it's not being handled appropriately. And only a vote of the people will fix the situation. So that tells you that there's a breakdown in our democratic well, system. And think we need about a, that. a bigger breakdown than just the felony enfranchisement right. issue. Yeah. What's and, the and biggest issue in the upcoming gubernatorial, the biggest impact in the upcoming gubernatorial election with who wins? What is it? Um, I would say Obamacare. Do we get a Medicare no, no, expansion no, in the, the state? state? The state. In the state. Obamacare. State. That's there they'll, are three say jobs, justices, probably. three justices okay. on the Supreme Court yeah. that are going to be replaced in January. You don't so think that makes a difference? Those, of course. As opposed to, you know, Obama That's a huge and Obama difference. Phone and all, you know, it's all nice, all well and good. But the fact of the matter is, is that those are issues that, that make a difference because our, you know, we just don't keep our laws up to date. A 70-year-old person, when all of us were younger, 70 years old, you know, if they weren't already in the ground, they were heading. They should be there, right? Sure. right. But nowadays, you look at, uh, uh, you know, you know, everybody, in, a lot of these guys in government. Look at all the people in the Congress and the Senate. They're all in their seventies. Some of them are in their early eighties, and this that, sure. and other thing. So we need to, and, and we are losing very good judges on the trial level who have to re retire when they're seventy. It's crazy. Well, Joe, I've, I have a question as a follow-up for that. Did did the Supreme Court decide which governor is going to get to make those choices? You know that issues come up. I mean. It's it's being heard right now. But here's yeah. the, to decide: here, Can Rick Scott name three judges on the way out? But or how just can the new he? Guy? His term ends before the new justices take office. So how can he possibly make that choice? He, they're litigating it. Of course, <laughs> I know. I know. Well, you litigate anything if you have three hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 Well, really? to Grant's point about uh, who the audience is that they, the politician is speaking to, like I, I get accused of uh, always. Uh, playing the race card and bringing up race. I believe that race is where it starts. You decide who you dislike, uh, especially if they aren't like you. And then you make all the policies that come along with the politics of whose you know, side you're on, quote unquote, as us far as- Us versus them. Us versus them. And you you uh, you cling on to plausible deniability and and logical fallacy, and you use fantasy. You live in that bubble, where in the back of your mind you know why you got into this, you know, and everything else you you pick and choose, you cherry pick, which justifies uh, your political links. So when Charlie Crist and and whoever is 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 uh, selling. To Northern Florida, they're selling racism. They're selling tough. They hear the word crime, bingo. They think about black people for the most part, or foreigners, you know, which is generally to, in their minds also dark people. Yeah, uh, which is why Ireland comes up and Trump says, you know, I love Ireland and, and I want to <laughs> embrace Norway. <laughs> you know, and they, they, yeah. they, they're, they're immigrants. Read some history. Yeah. yeah, and so. Well, let me ask this question. What impact do you think immigration has on the black community in Florida? Well, I mean, there's a there's a debate about that. There's discussion a debate. about that. Well, you know, 
the the immigrants that are willing to work for any amount of money okay, sure. basically sure. make it impossible sure. for anyone in the lower economic range to control that part of society. They lose that ability to control. So therefore, if I were black and I only had a GED and I was trying to get a construction sure. job, I want these guys coming in from Mexico and Guatemala. And I wouldn't want them in the workforce. Well, um, you know. Unless they had to get the same and That's why minimum don't. wage is important. Right. Well. And so. also uh, prosecuting companies that hire. Sure. Is All of those happen? things are important. But I tell you what, coming from the black community, I don't know a lot of people in the black community that want to be out in Homestead picking strawberries and tomatoes. You know, I think it, they exist, but I think it's not something I think that's, Alabama is a great example of this. Okay? Yes. They, they passed some very harsh anti-immigration laws, yeah. and black people did not go out and take those jobs, nor did the Nobody. white people. But it depends on and, the job. And, Construction yeah, but, jobs? But agricultural jobs like that, which, which Put that aside. comprise That's a great uh, yeah. amount of those yes. yeah. kind of jobs. Ag jobs have always been H-2A worker jobs, and, and it, no matter what coast you're on, that's, you, know, you, have, you bring in workers from, from foreign places, but take the, put that aside. Manufacturing jobs. Sure. Construction jobs, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Well, well, you, now think about the fact that a lot of these people are excluded from jobs because they have a felony past. They have a drug yeah, crime. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that is the direct result. And I think the most important thing to keep in mind when you're talking about felony and disenfranchisement is that our government spent a trillion dollars to conduct a war against the civilian population in this country, to conduct a war against the Fourth Amendment, yeah. and to imprison as many people as possible and it's a colorblind system, which is how they yeah. slid it through the door yeah. after the civil rights era. And they convinced people that there was a legitimate danger that they were protecting people from. And now we see states that have legalized medical marijuana. And what danger are people being protected from with federal marijuana well, And laws? the people that are benefiting from legalized marijuana... Uh, you know, cancer patients, people that, you know, PTSD, that's medical marijuana. PTSD, I'm talking about legalized recreational things, yeah. use. Uh, yeah. Black people are still being targeted and, and still being thrown under the bus and still being interjected into the, the, the prison uh, well, work population. If, I mean, if the unions the, were killed, unions were killed, which is what helped the black Americans in, in the inner in city the most, you know, unionized jobs. And, uh, you know, government jobs, postal workers, those kinds of jobs, those are what helped the black mm -hmm. community the most. You know, the, the and construction to some degree, but con union construction. But the debate, jobs. listen, on the marijuana thing, you know, I go into court sometimes, and I'm waiting in line, and they have, they're arraigning somebody for possession of marijuana. I almost feel like saying, come on, man. You know, if you have to do that nonsense, why don't you do it after hours or something so we don't have to waste <laughs> right. the time of the judge? Everyone's standing around the courtroom while you want to talk about 18 grams of marijuana or something. But as an employer, if you bring two candidates to me for a job and one of them smokes weed every night and the other one doesn't, I'm going to take the guy who doesn't smoke weed. Why do I want somebody walking in the in the morning half asleep or, you know, wow, this and, you know, missing? You know, yeah, it's, it's, an, interesting, it's still an interesting there. thing because – if the other guy has two martinis or three martinis when he gets home, uh, that's just a societal thing but to right, me. So that's or, just or a, oxycodone. A, yeah, but, but whatever <laughs> it is. Yeah, oxycodone. You see, that's the thing. Though. Yeah. You're talking about one of the world's most addictive drugs. Yes. Yeah. Another one of the world's most addictive drugs, yes. and a natural plant that's well, not. Considered take a look at two other things. Okay. Okay. First, traffic fines. $158 may not mean anything to the four of us sitting around this table. Oh, it means yeah. But yeah. somebody who's Me making too. $8 an hour, <laughs> yeah. it means a lot. Okay. Yeah, somebody who's making $300 right. a the week, that's, that's half the week's right. salary. On top, of of that, yeah. on top of that, if you are convicted of possession of marijuana, you lose your license for six months or a year. But not if a DUI. Now, what the hell sense does that make? Yeah. You know, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's punitive. It's the same like in, in child support, right? You know, if a guy is, you know, falls behind on child support, they take away his driver's license. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You yeah. know, but right. it's just. Or it, they it, put him in prison for, for uh, right. a month. Yeah, and that, then, it's, yeah, it's, very, it's, it's a backward domestic, system. But, domestic violence, right? You know, the, the girl said, oh, he dragged me by my hair across the floor. I lost consciousness. He strangled me. Where's my $1,500 check? Well, and the well, cops are going far afield to that, now. To that point, <laughs> yeah, listen, yeah, yeah, listen yeah. These, these, are all, these are crimes of poverty. You, you, uh, there's a, in the, in the case in Missouri where they were, you know, busted, you know, targeting, uh, ticketing 
African Americans yeah. disproportionately. Yeah. It was like their money, it was their cash cow, yeah. and they were doing. It. And then you can't Here afford too. to get out of it. Here too, but walking you, while black. If you were, yeah, yeah. Same thing. if yeah. you had the money, yeah. Two years which is typically, you know, if you're rich white. You know, first of all, they don't talk to you. But if they do, right. you can hire a lawyer to get out of it. Well, let's not You're listen. Still listen, there's a lot of poor white people too. No, no, yeah. of course, no, no that's, that's not. Well, what let me give you a I'm great saying. example of what you're talking about. Um, that came from Missouri, where they they stopped a lot of uh, police actions, and they started writing three hundred dollars zoning fines for your blinds being out of place. The small towns in, in St. Louis County in Missouri are like right. that yeah. because they 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 don't want to raise taxes. They just want to tax you a little bit here, a little bit there, right. and. They want to- and that's where these unfair systems have, have grown up. Two years ago, I had a case involving a young man that was being harassed in Overtown. And there was a couple cops there that were bad cops. You know, and I know everyone says, you know, there's just some bad cops. But most cops are good. Give me a break. But the, the <laughs> fact of the matter is, is that I had an arrest form. And the arrest form said on it that the police officer stopped the car because one of the taillights over... The license plate was inoperative. And then the Supreme Court of the United States, a bunch of very bright guys, they all went to really good law schools and that kind of thing. Someone comes to you and says, do you think that if a police officer approaches a car and the distinct odor of marijuana emanates from it, that that should give them probable cause to search the car? (laughs) Of course it should, unless it becomes a script for every moron in blue to walk around and announce. So I have this this arrest form. The arrest form says that the... uh, uh, that the car, the tail lights out. As the officer approached the car, the odor of marijuana came out, and the person driving the car said, "Officer, my license is suspended spontaneously." So I filed a FOIA request on these two cops. What's a FOIA request? Freedom of Information Act. Okay. And got like 150 arrest forms for that area from these guys over a year. Do you know how wow. many people? Amazingly, black people drove around in Overtown with bad tail lights, and they rolled down the window, <laughs> and the smell of marijuana yeah. came out, and they spontaneously said, Officer, I don't have my driver. 50 on each of these guys. Yeah. Well, I and was... So what's, the, what, what, but what's their motivation there? Is their motivation... Overtime. Money. Is it money? Is it money. Money. Yeah. yeah. And the worst part about police abuse in these circumstances is that the more you fight them, the more they get paid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They get paid to go to court. Right. Yeah. They get so the paid first thing that happens meet, is you, know, you stop them. Defense. Then there's three or four cars there, and they're all sort of standing around talking about it. And then when they're finished standing around talking about it for an hour, an hour and a half, then a suspect is put into each car, and yeah. the suspects are then driven to the jail. Then the guys stand around the jail, booking them for a longer period of time. So now we have about four or five hours of overtime for each of these guys we've gotten so far. Then when we go down to talk to the prosecutor about whether or not the case should be filed, eh, we have four or five more hours there than when we go to court. It's money. You're right. And, yeah. and let, me, let me punch that up another step, which is that let's say you're a citizen, Joe, that's out there on the street and something bad happens, something unconscionable happens, right? And you're the victim. You go to court. And... You say, look, you go to federal court. My civil rights have been violated. If the lawyers for the town or for the police department can find any excuse after the fact, that well, like some I, sort like of I did something in my past, that, that or? you did something wrong, anything after the fact, even if the cop on the beat had no idea that this was happening, yeah, then they will defeat your civil rights claim. And there's a, a, a right now. There's a Supreme Court case by a man named Lozman mm-hmm. that's being heard. He's up in Riviera Beach. This is his second Supreme Court case in eight years. Very special guy, and he's trying to defeat that doctrine of law that I just mentioned. The idea that they can come up with literally any excuse after the fact, and it's their lawyers, and that can defeat a civil rights claim that's properly founded. Yet, if the situation is reversed, sure, right. If it, 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 they can find, uh, they basically can say, well, I shot you. I'm the cop. I shot you. And, you know, you have to evaluate everything under this reasonable man standard, which is to say you can't go there and second guess me as a cop. I have pulled the trigger. I was standing there. He, the judge has to consider what I might reasonably know at the time and just consider in my shoes. But when you go to get redress – 
It's exactly the opposite. And hopefully the Supreme Court reverses that. But that's where we've st stood for a long What's time. What's the name of that case? Do you know the name of it's, that case? Uh, I think it's Lozman versus Riviera okay. Beach. Okay, which is interesting because here's the thing. Clearly, in, in a society such as ours, it's necessary to have policing. And uh, it's not perfect, clearly, but it's necessary. And I also uh, agree on one hand that the police need to have certain protections because they are putting on a uniform and carrying a gun and they are the ones that are running into the, the direction of and trouble. they don't have law degrees. And they, well, they definitely don't have law degrees and they probably don't have a lot of training in, in a lot of areas that if they would have better training in how to deal with um, you know, talking people down or approaching situations sure. with a more level head. But sure. look, bottom line is, you know, these are people that, that become police officers. Uh, you, can, you can come up with any reason for their background and wanting to become a police officer. It's a tough job. Yeah, but it, there's a pendulum for all of these actions. And right now the pendulum is swung all the way in favor of the law enforcement officer. Yeah, you, all you have to do is, is watch the news not, and you'll get that you, information. No, no, no. But when you try a case, when I try a case in criminal court, I try the cops. And when you interview the jury afterwards, they don't believe cops anymore. They don't believe the cops as much. And the reason is these things. Yeah. These things. Cell phones. Yeah. You know, they're now recording what these guys do. Yeah. And Cell for phones. instance, I and assume, let them me live. ask this question. Yeah. Is it legal to record a conversation with someone if that person doesn't know it? Not in the state of Florida. Good. Is it legal to record a conversation with a police officer if he doesn't know it? Absolutely it is, yes. even surreptitiously. That's and right. Yeah. Because that, he that has no is, expectation of privacy, but most people don't know that. And, and, so I tell my clients, you get stopped by the cops, you immediately turn on that cell phone, but yeah. don't put it in their face. Right. Like, lay Keep it down it somewhere. Yeah. Um, to yeah, Joe's exactly. earlier point, I personally refuse to judge all cops by the actions of a few good ones. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> no, no the, there's an important But case. don't you think the answer yeah. is... If like I believe that what we need to do is pay them more money and say to them, you know what? If you really don't like to be called a cocksucker by a seventeen year old kid, find another job. Yes, that's but if true. you want this hundred thousand yes. dollar a year job, you better be ready to be called that by some seventeen year old kid. Yes. Right. And if we got to that point where every time a cop makes a decision, he's thinking to himself, do I want to put a hundred thousand dollar job on the line? Right. Maybe they would think differently. We don't pay them enough. We don't demand enough. Like for instance, different cities. Carl Gables in in, in Miami requires you to have a college degree or a certain yeah. amount of training. I mean, a college degree in the city of Miami. I mean, they you know Miami they call you does, doctor. The city right? of Miami I think the training has to. Well, no, of course, the not. training has to. Or you know, they <laughs> it has to tell them that uh, offending your ego is not a crime. Offending your sense right. of, of uh, superiority is yeah. not a crime. And the training is important because they've done studies. Everyone says, well, you know, if we increase the number of minority officers, that will solve the problem. No, no it won't. No, it hasn't. Because no. unless no, you get no. to a saturation point of minority officers, which we've now proven, yes. incidentally, with Latins in Miami, okay, we now have enough Latins in the police force to know that does make a difference. But if you put 15 or 20 or 30% blacks on a force, that doesn't do it. It's not enough. Look, So I, the I, answer's training. I interviewed a, an LAPD officer, a former LAPD officer, okay, who quit because he worked in the Rampart Division mm -hmm. during the time of, yes, that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Alex Salazar. He's a whistleblower. And he explained to me that in the police departments, you have some very hardcore white nationalist, white supremacist sociopaths. And unfortunately, those few rotten apples, yeah, they do spoil the bunch because they go out there and they change the norms inside of the police department. Yes. And police departments are paramilitary organizations. They, there's a certain fraternity that they – they have to encourage, to be frank, because there's, you know, they are a single force. But when you allow that kind of misconduct, that kind of sociopath, and, and many of these departments have them, not all of them do, but a, a lot of them do, and the problem, that changes the culture, and that culture then filters down into the, the, the civil rights abuses. The problem is not only officers who don't follow the rules. But officers who travel with them who don't report them when they don't follow Which is the, the culture. Yes. And when you get both of those groups together, 
I think you're over 50%. Okay. See, yeah, now, to and, me, and, there's... But then when you, when you take that and you combine that with the fact that we have laws that are outdated, it, it creates a situation where it, it makes it much more difficult to enforce all of the laws. Right, so it's, three, so it's a three-part you know. issue. And, I mean, maybe the fourth, the fourth part is the people. But it's, you know, the police are only one part of this. The courts are the other part of this. Mm -hmm. And... and but it appears to me that the legislate the legislature is another part of this, sure. and I'm not I'm not sure. It's some it's information that I'd like to know, which is why one of the reasons we do this program is what can I do to go change things legislatively locally well, here in Miami? Do I need to? Does it have to go to the state level? Can I do something on the local level? Can I do it on the city level? Can the county level? I don't know. These are the things that. We want voting to you learn. Can't. Well, I, you know, actually, voting locally, you probably could. But you voting know, is but not voting a state. Is actually, look, yeah. being informed and then making an informed choice when you vote on every level is the thing that you can do. The first mm -hmm. thing, right? But you said but, earlier, early in this program, you said something very interesting, Grant, and that was that it seems that too many of these things are being left to the electorate to make a decision. And that's a broken system of democracy because when I vote for well, a representative to, to go it? take, when I vote for somebody to represent me in Tallahassee, they should be carrying what I want them to do and voting on it. And what's happening is these people are not doing their jobs apparently because everything has to become a vote to go back to the people now. No, no, this no, but, this well, voting rights thing shouldn't have to go back to the people. The legislature should something. be able to say, hey, this let's, is wrong, let's change it. Let's look at something we've just right? seen on Tomorrow. television recently. Okay? Tell me. With this horrible tragedy up in Fort Lauderdale. All of a sudden now... Park. Parkland we, shooting? Yeah. Yes. We have a couple of kids, right, who are now in front of the cameras all the time. You look at those guys, you know exactly what they're going to be 15 years from now. They're going to be in the legislature. They stand up there and they rattle off whatever it is they're supposed to rattle off and this, that, and the other thing. And now the CBS is embedded with some of them and this, that, and the other thing. At the end of the day, our federal system of courts insulates the judges from decisions they have to make. As much as we may get some bad apples that we can't do anything about, we need to do something about the state judges. They can't be elected. The state judges have to be appointed and serve during good behavior. If we have a good governor, we're going to get good judges. If we have a crappy governor, we, we may get crappy judges. Where were you in court yesterday when I was in court? <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the, the fact of the matter is, did, there's a new show on TV now that called I can't remember for the people or something like that, and it's about these young kids in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, and you see these federal judges and, and, and how they act, and then you compare it, like for instance with this situation again in Parkland, you know, with the 18 year old brother of Cruz, right, who is trespassing, and four brave deputies, armed deputies you know, secure him and his skateboard, you know, as he's hmm. running around the campus. And then some judge who is elected decides to put a $500,000 bond on him. Now, do you think a federal judge would put a $500,000 bond on someone who's trespassing? No, but that woman's got to run for re-election. Yeah, but the thing also in that situation, let's be real, that's, that's a, a reaction to what happened. I mean, that's a, a, that's a pure reaction to what happened. And, do it. and you know what? I, I agree with Joe, except that, like, I want you to think about the other angle of this, which is that in a, a typical criminal case, um, you know, you have these elected judges and they want to be able to campaign that they're tough on crime. Yeah. And As beyond, the legislators. Mm, uh, yeah. But it, just like legislature, just like Charlie Crist did for many years, and just like every politician in this country did for about 20 years or so. And let's be real here. We were Catch all attention. there. In the early 1990s, there was a massive crime problem, and it felt out of control on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. you know. But we're not there today. Things have changed, thank goodness, for the better. Yeah. right? But I mean, with the state court judges that are elected, I think the worst example is here in Miami-Dade County where you have a state court judge whose family owns a bunch of no-tell motels. And, <laughs> and, and, and it goes straight to the heart of what Joe's Do talking tell. about, where it's <laughs> like, you know, how is it that the amount of money somebody can raise to become a judge – or if they do something outrageous from the bench to get attention, how is that the way that we decide the most numerous crop of judges there are that make most of the decisions in the criminal courts in this state and in this country? But really? Now, there are some judge positions that are elected, and there are some that are appointed, and there right. are some that, after an appointment, 
require an election to stay on the bench sure. the if, appellate can, courts. if contended, if the contested. Appellate courts. The appellate the appellate courts. Okay, yeah. and can you explain to, to our listen, listeners the difference well, between an, an appellate court and these yeah, different the, judges? Yeah, an, an appellate court is you have a trial. A tri we go for a trial. Uh -huh. If you don't like that result, you can take an appeal. The appeal goes to an appellate court, okay. which generally has a minimum of three judges looking at it, and then sometimes there's a court above it. Those courts in Florida, the governor gets a list of candidates. The governor picks one. They then are – they run what's called a retention election. Should Judge Stone be retained in office for six years? We have never yet failed to retain one of these appellate judges. So it's a good – but they do know that they can be kicked out of office if they act in an outrageous fashion. So now the question is – the, the and, and like for instance, one of the things that I would like to see happen in Dade County uh, – again, I don't know how broad this – which is – the, the county where Miami is, is right. located is, I believe that we should elect judges by district the same way we elect representatives. They would serve countywide, but every judge would have to run from a district. What would that do? Number one, it would make sure that the demographics of our bench match the demographics of the community, number one. Number two, you wouldn't have to be rich to run to be a judge because instead of running on a countywide basis – and having to deal with one of these disgusting brokers, you know, the, you know that, that there's like six or seven of them that, that all line up and basically say, well, Judge Stone, you know, uh, you either pay me a certain amount of money or I'm going to run someone against you who's a female whose name ends in a vowel, okay? So you, mm -hmm. better, you better pay me my fee or that's what's going to happen. So now all of a sudden people would run in districts so they'd need less money to run. They would have more connection to the community, but they would still serve countywide. But we have to do something – to solve the problem so our judges are free from these kinds of pressures. And so, like, at this time of year, you guys probably don't get it. I get a minimum of five or six emails a week saying that they're having a cocktail party for this judge. It's not right for judges to be functioning like trained monkeys yeah. at cocktail parties. It's wrong. You know, this firm, you know, is sponsoring a cocktail party for the judge. It's bad for the judge. It's bad for the people. And it puts the judge in a position that's an uncomfortable position. They shouldn't have to do that. You know, wow. we have to figure out a way to finance. If we're going to elect them, we have to figure out a way to finance them so that everyone has the same opportunity. Right, yes. and I mean, everybody that, that uh, lives here, you know, we all live here together. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a stake in this. Um, I've said this many times before that one of the big problems is the, the consistent dumbing down of our electorate you know, removing civics from schools and uh, not having these conversations about how the actual mm -hmm. systems that govern us and our, and our community and our fellow citizens actually function. But news, we don't, I mean, the other day I was watching, they were running this thing on, on Putin, on the Putin election, right? I listened to three, CBS, NBC, ABC, and they pointed out that Putin had been reelected. Not one of them. You know, not one of the, you know, the candy treats we were watching on TV bothered to mention how long his term of office was because they don't care. It's just not important. Information is not important anymore. Well, let me, let me pick up that cudgel and run with it for just one second. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons why all these abuses happen is that it's a very vast system, but not a lot of information really makes it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. As, as a journalist... A vast majority of what I do is mining public data that anybody could access. And putting it out there. And putting it out there because it's not put out there in an accessible form. Sure. and Because it's not exciting and interesting well, not unless you make that. it that way. It's not just that. It's that these courts don't have any incentive to do this, to make it easier to find out what's going on. Because nobody likes more scrutiny. And on top of that, they make money on... You know, people – look, lawyers make money on people coming to them to navigate the legal system, and they know it. Yeah. There's self-interest there. And what you're talking about with the judges having to go to do the cocktail circuit with the, the law firms, again, there's a conflict of interest there. And there's a lot of these. And as they multiply through our political systems, they create the kind of well, inequities. Well, let's talk about the issues financing. that you were yeah, raising yeah, yeah. before. The, the, the minimum mandatory sentences. Oh, that's well part of it. How many people – talk about or are aware of the number of children that we have in Dade County who aren't fed except for money coming from the public. The number of children who get breakfast and lunch and some of them dinner, it's some ridiculously high number. Yeah. No one cares about that. 
And it's horrible. They should care about that. That's an issue that I care about. The minimum mandatories, I think, is just fun. You know, they all want to show, you know, let's have a minimum mandatory of 120 years. That shows that you're even tougher than somebody else. And it doesn't solve any problems because, as you say, you end up then with the problem with an aging population and yeah. this, that, and the other thing. But we have to get back to a point of having journalists who get information out there yeah. instead of just, you know, you hear the same stuff all the time. I think it's a real shame that they were blowing up people in Austin. But, you know, maybe that's after I heard it once or twice, I was finished with that. Thank you. Maybe there's a, that's the direction that, you know, someone like yourself, Grant, can well, I think uh, doing maybe put... Put the information out there. If you have a well, box, I, you know, this is, these are the databases that you can access to find out information. Here it is. Go for it. You know? Well, yeah. that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm starting the coalitionreport.com. We're literally in our last stage of putting mm -hmm. the website up, which is to create a general purpose website that takes some of the niche uh, news websites that I've worked for and take what I'm doing with those and the best of it and bringing it into a more general format. What's it called again? The coalition? The coalition report.com. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. We, I mean, these are things that we, that we here at felony Miami are trying to bring to the light and turn the volume up on because uh, I think half the battle is if we can help to turn people on to the ways that they can make a change, mm -hmm. that the ways that they can, oh, I didn't know. All I all I have to do is call this guy or write a letter to this guy or send a text to that person. Uh, you know, there's a lot of tools available to us with all of the, the, the technology that we've developed. I have this great little thing is called ResistBot. And uh, it's, a, it's a text and I, you text it in and it, and it brings up, you put your zip code in and it brings up the uh, who your, your state representatives are and, um, let's and talk it lets this. you know what's up. If you went to the black coalition in Florida, the legislature, and those guys all let the leadership know, hey, unless you do something about this enfranchisement of felons, we are not going to vote with you on anything. You'd probably get a result. I mean, it's interesting to watch what's going on in Washington now in terms of the deal making when, you know, it's a whole new system of deal making that we never had before because that's what we have to do. But it's, it's, it, 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 unequally, unequally impacts the African-American community and the black community. Yeah, well, politically, we are exiting, uh, slowly, an era of deeply embedded inequity throughout our political systems yeah. from yeah, gerrymandering, okay? And what the Koch brothers recognized in 2009 and strategically took advantage of, nobody else realized until 2012, which is that, you know, taking the state houses would be a stepping stone to yeah. creating sure. a lock a lockstep uh, majority in Congress, it mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it definitely worked. But I mean, it's something that was happening beforehand. Like uh, Tom Delay in Texas and the Republican majority in the early two thousands was doing the same thing, and then you know it all blew apart. And in two thousand six, America sent Democrats to control the Congress and the, the House and the Senate, and people thought, oh, you know, things are changed. Obama got elected. People thought, oh, things are changed. And they demonstrated how, you know, strategic outrage could take one part of the system and turn it into a whip that wound up, you know, yeah. telling the entire well, cart and horse where to go. While we're on, on a tangent, think. though, think about this. Yeah, it is. The other great issue is, in 1960, it was okay for the Democrats to get more electoral votes than they got popular votes with John Kennedy. That was perfectly all right. Now, it's not all right for Trump. Okay, so what's the answer? Well, the answer is is that we should elect by popular vote. Okay? At this point, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, maybe, Bush, maybe, too. maybe. Yeah. But how about if forty nine? <laughs> how about if forty nine states decide? You know how we solve this problem? Let's kick California out. No because if, no, no. <laughs> I like if we California. Kick, if we kick California out, then we'll never ever again have a problem with a disparity between yeah, electoral listen. votes and popular look, votes. Look, but the we, thing about California, <laughs> yeah, yeah, listen, California is the sixth largest economy in the world, yeah. not in the state, in, in the world. The world. The world. We need California right now, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing, you know, in the 225 plus years of American history. There were only a couple of votes where the popular vote did not decide the presidency, but in the yeah. last four elections, half of them. But go back to the early so, stages. So that shows you that the there's The deal that they made with yeah. the 13 colonies was that the big 
colonies couldn't overrun the little ones. That was the reason why, why the they Senate, did. That's why the Senate was created. Right, and but that's also the purpose of the Electoral College, and the, and the reason because so in other words, if the we go to the if Electoral we go, College okay. was to support slavery, oh, because this uh, yeah yeah the slave states needed the extra votes yeah. to maintain okay. their so economic system. If we switch to a popular vote thing, then the new electoral strategy is you get more campaign votes. in Massachusetts, New York, Florida. Illinois, Texas, and California, and screw the rest of the country, right? I, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's yeah. true because each one of those other smaller states, not necessarily just – and look at Texas, by the way. You know, it's a red state. I mean, you can be a big state and be red. You can be a big state and be blue. Yeah. All, all the gradations in the middle. All you have to do is go to those states. You just t talk to any of these, these, these big political guys. Yeah, well, tell well you. right now, all of those states are being left out in the cold, and those states are the economic engines of this country that have created a 4% unemployment rate. So Let's talk about and wrap it up with this. There are these four states that still disenfranchise their felons after they've paid for their crimes. Mm -hmm. Maybe Florida will be the first to change that out of the last four. That's going to be left up to the voters. And I don't know when that's going to be on the ballot. Is it going to be on in November? This no, yeah, this fall. It, it's November going to be on November. 6th, think, okay. Yeah, so it'll be – so there will be a big election turnout because it's first a big Tuesday election. First Tuesday of November. First Tuesday of November. That's when we vote. And one of these days, maybe they'll make it a national holiday. Or so make it a Sunday. <laughs> yeah. <or something>. yeah. <laughs> here's one of the ironies that you may end up with. You know, everybody patted themselves on the ballot. When Brown versus Board of Education was, oh, the blacks should be happy now. You know, they have an equal. Well, they weren't happy, okay, because there were other issues they were concerned about. If you go to the felons and you enfranchise them, they may say, hey, that's nice. Thank you very much. Now, how about a job and a house? Okay. It's more important. Well, listen, to vote. you and know now what? Now they get to vote. Yeah, now they get well, to vote know, to maybe you, affect a change. That's yes. how you vote for a politician that will ban the box. Exactly. Yeah. So one of the things that we like to do here at Felony Miami when we wrap up the show, because uh, a lot of us have uh, backgrounds in music, is we like, right. to ask, we like to ask our guests one time around the table before we wrap it up. And I just want to thank all of you guys for your input Thanks on for this topic. Uh, it's an, an incredible conversation, and uh, you three gentlemen are, are uh, brilliant and, and passionate, and we appreciate you taking your time out to be here. So here's the question. What recording artist, album, or song had a major impact on your life or helped change your life, and why? You don't have to answer all of those questions, but what recording artist or music or album had a big effect on your life? I'm going to start with Grant. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with Philip Glass. Wow, okay. And that's I was, I was at the Florida State School of Music way back when, huh. and I met Philip Glass, and I got to ask him a few questions at a round table, and I learned that he was not a full-time musician for his entire life. Interesting. <laughs> and I realized that you know, while you do want to get things out there while you can, you may have more time to do it than you realize. Nice. And his music, I ironically, is super identifiable. Very Like, identifiable. you can hear some Philip Glass stuff and go, that sounds like and, Philip Glass. you know, <laughs> one of the, the great films that he was involved in, where he actually appeared on screen, is The Truman Show. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's one movie that has become ever more relevant since it came out, is The Truman Show. No so. doubt. No doubt. AJ. Oh, my God. You said... Artists and music, and uh, my head's like there's all kinds of stuff bouncing around in my skull right now. Nice. So I don't know if I can nail down one, but I remember when I changed my direction towards music, and that was when I was coming home from Fifi's Barbershop. Oh, I, was, uh, I was about seven years old. <laughs> it was in Overtown, yeah, 20th Street, and we used to walk down every other Saturday. And on the way back, I can the apartment's still there. Someone was blasting. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Well, James Brown. You can say that. <laughs> and I heard the music, and then, and that's when I went Zoom right, right to music. I mean, I was musical before that, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's when I started. James, James Brown got you. James Brown. Nice. Other than listening to like 60s, 70s, and 80s stuff from my childhood, the thing I listen to most often is Tupac. And the, and the reason is because the guy was a philosopher, the guy was a poet, yes. and it got me listening to some of this stuff. Like, I have a grandson, an 11-year-old grandson, mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff he listens to I think is garbage. Right. But the fact of the matter is it tunes you into what to listen to and this, that, and the other thing. But, I mean, Tupac, I, I think, let people know that that's a serious music form. 
no, no doubt. just junk. No yes. doubt. And this just lets us all know that music has no limits and no boundaries, you know, and uh, we, you know, because the yeah, Tupac, Tupac from you and Philip Glass from you, you know. Now I'm going to have to go listen to Philip Glass. James Brown, I kind of, <laughs> yeah, you know, I see yeah. yeah. yeah, we'll James Brown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing thing. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here, and thank you all for listening. For the rest of the team, I'm Joe Stone. Thanks for listening to Felony Miami. We'll see you next time. 